What's up guys, JP back at you once again bringing you guys another video. So today's video initially was going to be a 10 and 10 video which is where I review 10 films in about 10 minutes but I decided to scrap that because the time limit sometimes does a hindrance to me obviously only talking about one movie for a minute but it's still fun to do them sometimes especially if it's titles I don't have a ton of stuff to say about but I think that there's a few titles in here today that I want to talk about that warrant a little bit more time so I decided to drop the time limit and basically I don't know where to go with my review videos anymore initially I just did single reviews you know five to ten minute videos where I just talk about one film uh, and then I started doing the 10 and tens which I review a bunch of stuff very rapidly people seem to like those but maybe they're a little bit too short uh, so I'm gonna do a mixture of that today and I'm just gonna call it what I've been watching similar to what we do on the podcast with the segment what we watched uh, and I'm basically gonna just talk about a few titles that I've watched recently and I'm going to you know spend a little bit of time but not full length reviews on them let me know what you guys prefer do you prefer the high quantity uh, low time limit of the 10 and 10 do you prefer the standard single reviews where it's a 5 to 10 minute video on one film or do you like this new style that I'm doing now Please, if you're watching this, just drop a comment. Let me know what you prefer, and then uh, we'll go from there. But starting with the first title, uh, I got in a few screeners from Australia. Uh, the company Umbrella Entertainment. I know you guys have heard me talk about them before. One of my favorite Blu-ray companies right now. Uh, and they sent me a copy of Stephen King's Silver Bullet. Now, Silver Bullet is a really, really solid werewolf film. It came out in the year 1985, I want to say. Yeah, 1985. Uh, starring Corey Haim, Gary Busey's also in here, basically about a kid who cannot walk, he uses a wheelchair, but not any wheelchair, he actually has a gas powered, you know, motorized wheelchair to get around, and a werewolf begins picking off people in his town, and he believes he knows the identity to the werewolf, the werewolf knows that he knows the identity of him, so the werewolf comes after the kid, it's up to him, his sister, and his uncle to stop this thing, and I've seen this film before. I thought it was good, but watching it this time, I absolutely loved it. Like, this movie is great. There's so much good cinematography in this film to where you see this suspenseful sort of shot where it, like, shows the werewolf in the background and you know he's coming up on the kid and, and the idea that he can't move quickly because he has the wheelchair, he can't just run away, uh, is, uh, you know, frightening. So they do a lot of fun things with that. It's, of course, it's based on a Stephen King novel, uh, and man, this movie just was really good. I think the only complaint that I had was the werewolf looked a little bit weak at times, but he still looked really good at times, too. Uh, this movie just all around super shocked me this time watching it I absolutely loved it and the transfer is outstanding on the umbrella release I highly recommend you guys pick this up if you haven't it is region free it says region B on the back but it does work uh, on region free players might have been a mistake who knows uh, but yeah that's silver bullet I meant it works on region one players uh, after that, we have another umbrella here, and that is The Land That Time Forgot from the year 1978. Now, this movie's kind of interesting because when I was a kid, I would often flip through the channels and just stop on something that looked cool and then never know what the title of it was. That's one of the cases with this film. I remember it was really early in the morning, like 5 a.m., and I'd stayed up all night, and I was at my cousin's house, and I was just trying to find something on TV to go to sleep to, and I happened upon this film, and it was probably over halfway done, but I really liked it. I thought it was cool, and uh, it always reminded me that I like these. It was probably the first film that I seen that had like the you know stop motion effects and like there's a lot of these movies like this about a prehistoric island that you know has all these dinosaurs on it and things like that and I really kind of like those movies even though I haven't seen a ton of them and I always wondered what the one that I seen when I was a kid was and here was this film um, which is actually I think a pretty common title uh, for these sort of movies there's a bunch of these type of movies but uh, especially in the you know 50s 60s 70s uh, but yeah this this one follows um, 
a few characters cast away maroon on a mysterious uncharted island and it turns out it's inhabited by all these you know dinosaurs and stuff like that and then there's also uh you know natives to the island that they have to deal with it's pretty cool uh it's not the best movie in the world some of the effects actually do look a little silly and uh not the greatest so it doesn't hold up as much as i remembered it in my memory uh but it was still pretty solid uh, after that, we have uh, another umbrella here. I did review this recently on the podcast, but I wanted to talk about it a little bit more, and that is Orca the Killer Well. I know everybody doesn't listen to the podcast. This one came out in the year uh, 1977, and this is a Jaws ripoff. So there there have been tons of Jaws ripoffs after 1975 when Jaws came out, and most of them are bad. There's a handful of good ones. Another good one is Roger Corman's Piranha, which is kind of uh, capitalizing on the success of Jaws. Uh, Orca is probably the other good one. So Orca involves a fisherman who sees an Orca whale kill a great white shark I think and he's very fascinated by this and he believes if he captures one he can sell it for high money. Uh, people warn him not to do this orcas are highly intelligent he goes out anyway he goes to harpoon an orca whale and it hits the male's fin and goes into the female he was trying to capture the male uh, the female tries to commit suicide with the propeller and uh, he drags it on board it's dead it has a miscarriage a little baby whale falls out and you just hear this blood curdling scream from the male orca and basically he wants revenge because this time it's personal and he basically goes into the fishing village destroys it all stuff like that there's a big grand finale on some um, icebergs and that's kind of your movie uh, orcas good it's a little cheesy though it definitely comes off a little silly especially when they try to add all this personality and you know humanity if you will to the whales um, it just seems a little unrealistic like I know they're really smart and have emotions and stuff like that but I mean to go and get revenge just seems a little silly to me so um, not the greatest movie in the world I didn't really like it the first time I seen it I liked it a little bit more this time but I still am not overly in love with it but this transfer is really good from Umbrella here and I know there's a few fans of this film Jerry's a huge fan of it and uh, he you know lo loves this movie so th this would be a perfect pickup for him after that we have a Severin release and this is Threads uh, this movie from what I gather I haven't done extensive research on it but from what I gather it says on the back here I'm gonna actually read this it says in September 1984 it was aired on the BBC and shocked tens of millions of UK viewers Four months later, it was broadcast in America and became the most watched basic cable program in history. After more than three decades, it remains one of the most acclaimed and shattering made-for-television movies of all time. So this film was made in almost this pseudo-documentary style with a little bit of a narrative to it as well about a nuclear war or the aftermath of nuclear war kind of the build-up and then the aftermath of nuclear war and the fallout and my god this was such an interesting watch like i highly recommend you guys pick up this seven re seven release and check this out because this was such a fascinating movie We've all seen post-apocalyptic movies. This one, less cinematic, less of a movie, um, less narrative, and more just raw and realistic. This film feels very, very realistic to what would happen, at least in my mind, and you know, from my limited knowledge on the subject, seems like that this is how it would go down. This seems like exactly what would happen in a post-nuclear war world and it is frightening it is scary it is raw it punches you in the soul it depresses you guys like this movie is a depressing movie but at the same time while watching it while seeing all this terrible stuff that was going on all these people starving all these people dying all the badness that's going to come for years and years after a situation like this if we survive the population dwindling to that of what it was in the dark ages 
to see the you know crops and everything else die the fight for survival it kind of reminded me that life is not so bad even when things go bad they could always be a hell of a lot worse and this movie is a interesting watch it puts things in perspective it really sort of shows you a step-by-step -step basis what would kind of happen you know it goes like it shows you what would happen one day after the 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 nukes uh, you know two days you know a week a month a year 10 years you know 15 years 20 years it it, it tells you realistically what would happen uh, you know speculatory as well but what would happen in a situation like this and it is just frightening uh, from what I understand they even showed this in classrooms it's something that's very graphic and and very disturbing but I think it's something that is an important piece of cinematic history uh, especially since it was made for television this is such a neat release by Severin there's actually audio commentary with the director um, and then some uh, bonus features that I'm definitely gonna check out because this was this was fascinating honestly after that we have uh, the gruesome twosome here put out by arrow video this is actually a Herschel Gordon Lewis film, and I thought it was just the gruesome twosome, but it actually has a bonus feature, uh, a vampire-inspired Herschel Gordon Lewis film called A Taste of Blood, and that's a bonus feature on here. Um, yeah, the, so I, I'm not overly familiar with Herschel Gordon Lewis. Like, I've seen a handful of his movies. I Actually, never mind. I've seen one of his movies, I think. I might have seen another one. I can't remember. One of his, like, later ones. But... I've seen Blood Feast, which I, I watched on Arrow, and um, I'd heard about Blood Feast for a long, long time. I, I knew what it was and stuff like that, and it was about what I expected. I didn't overly love it, but I could see why it was important and why it was cool and stuff like that. Uh, but this one, I feel like, is Blood Feast, but a little bit better. They had a little bit of comedy to it, which works. Uh, it still has this like slow killing sequences where it's like shot for like pure shock sake and like you know you have to use your imagination to wonder what it would be like seeing this type of gore uh for you know uh like i think this came out in like 1967 so to kind of you know a little bit before night of the living dead to see this like blood and gore and stuff and, and like would it be shocking you have to kind of use your imagination to put yourself there um but yeah it, it was uh it was pretty neat you know it's about this mother and and she runs a wig, wig shop and her son's a killer and, and stuff like that it, it was it was something cool you know you got a little scalping going on there which is neat uh i like this one a little bit more than blood feast i still not overly in love with herschel gordon lewis films but i definitely find them intriguing they're pretty cool oh and the transfer on this a little beat up like it is i mean it's a good transfer but the film stock is just really bad you know it's like lines running through it and stuff like that there was you just couldn't save the amount of uh, stuff that you would want to save in a, in a film like this. I imagine the print was extremely rough. Uh, after that, we have a absolute classic from the Master of Horror, Dario Argento. This is the uh, Suspiria release by Umbrella. Uh, there's also a Synapse release. I don't own that one, but I do have this Umbrella one. Uh, I can't tell you which transfer is better, but it seems like some people are leaning towards the Synapse who, who have seen both of these. Um, I'm actually surprised they're not the exact same transfer. I figured they would have been. Uh, but Suspiria came out in the year um, 1977. Uh, follows this uh, girl who goes to a dance academy. Turns out it's run by a coven of witches. Uh, and it's basically a style film. You know, it's very, very much like a, a lot of people would say a style over substance. There is substance in Suspiria, but definitely heavy on the style. Very beautiful film. Absolutely one of my favorite uh, movies of all time. Uh, I've come to love this movie. I liked it uh, a little bit when I first seen it. Actually, I probably didn't like it that much at all. I think I gave it like a 6.5. Uh, and then the second time I watched it, I much more appreciated. Then I seen it in 35 millimeter this year and appreciated it even more. Uh, of course, Blu-ray makes that appreciation go up. Uh, it's just a great movie. Like Suspiria is is classic. I, I love this uh, classic black and red artwork too, with a little bit of white. After that, um, we have a Vinegar Syndrome release, and this is Lucifer's Women. So it says, in the year 1954, three women claim to have made love to the devil himself. So this is a very interesting movie, kind of an interesting little 
um, I guess, released by uh, Vinegar Syndrome. It's actually not one movie, it's actually two. So, uh, essentially, there was a movie titled Lucifer's Women. I watched this uh, a little while ago, so it is a little loose in my memory. I do know that it has something about the devil needing to, like, reincarnate himself, so he gets this magician to get this girl... Uh, that he can sacrifice, and, but the magician sort of like has feelings for her, and the the you know he's mad. So um, it's about that, and and that's pretty cool. But the real cool story to this film comes from uh, the fact that this film was actually never released on home video and was considered uh, an assumed lost. And Vinegar Syndrome actually restored it and and put it out from the negative elements. Um, and they also did a re restoration on the film titled Dr. Dracula, which is actually Lucifer's Women reworked, added scenes, and released as a different movie. So that's always very fascinating when that happens. And, and give it to Vinegar Syndrome for digging stuff up like this. Because even though I didn't love this movie, you know, there's a lot of nudity in it. Some, some cool, like, satanic stuff. But it was kind of boring, honestly. It's a slow burn. But still... The fascination that I have for these type of stories, these lost movies, these films that are that you know possibly could never see the light of day, and then a company like Vinegar Syndrome comes around and restores them, and then you find out that this film was actually released as another film too, with you know different shots and and a different, slightly different story, uh, and you know you hear that history and it's just fascinating for film fans like I love stuff like that and Vinegar Syndrome is really a cool company for finding and releasing such oddities and I, I very much praise them for that this came out in 1974 um, it's not the best movie in the world honestly but I, I highly recommend the the story of it and uh, there, the, it looks like there's um, a commentary on here as well uh, which would be interesting to hear probably goes into more detail about the two different versions of this film. I didn't watch the second film. After that, we got a awesome release here. This is Night of the Living Dead, courtesy of Criterion. Now, first off, I do have to give my honest opinions on the case itself. I do not love this style from Criterion. It is all personal preference. But it is the standard sort of um, boxed case, and then the inside actually is um, sort of like this digi book. Now, the only problem I have with these is they're kind of flimsy. The corners get bent up easy. It's just not, if, if, you, if this is a film that you're going to watch a lot, taking it in and out of this case on and off the shelf kind of damages these type of cases. I much prefer for the keep cases, I honestly don't like the Digibook style at all. Um, so that is one of my complaints. But the actual release itself, the contents is great. It came with a poster you just saw there. Uh, and this movie, first of all, let's give a little love to the cover because this is a fantastic cover. And I normally don't like Criterion's covers, but this is a good cover. Uh, Night of the Living Dead, classic, 1968, one of the best films ever made. It revolves around a couple of survivors who all of a sudden find themselves in a zombie apocalypse. Of course, it was not a zombie apocalypse back then because it hadn't been done. And they barricade themselves in a farmhouse and they kind of get at each other's throats a little bit and need to survive the night to hopefully make it out of there and, you know, continue their lives while these monsters outside who are us, you know, humans, and they're eating people. So it's man such a great creative awesome idea of course George Romero didn't even think of these as zombies when they uh, initially you know came up with the concept they were ghouls he called them ghouls uh, and that's pretty interesting you know because he birthed zombies like this literally created the zombie genre and it was so fascinating to know that and I've met George Romero before he was an amazing person I absolutely loved meeting him um, I've only met like three celebrities in my life, three, you know, film people, and uh, George Romero was probably my favorite because of just how nice he was. I wish I got to talk to him more um, because unfortunately he passed away this past year, but such a good memory. So glad that that happened. Night of the Living Dead, awesome. The transfer on this is great. It is a great transfer. I always forget how much I like Night of the Living Dead, and then I sit back and watch it, and I'm like, 
Wow, dude, this movie is so good. It really is so good. Some people say that, you know, once you've watched it a few times, you get annoyed at Barbara's screaming. But for some reason, I don't. Yeah, she's annoying because she doesn't stop screaming, but I just, like, think that that's her character and it actually fits her. You know, she's she's a woman who seems to, um, you know, be be kind of reserved and, and not, you know, it's the 60s, you know, not not super, you know... I guess independent you know relying on others and then uh, she you know ends up in the situation but yeah transfer great on this by the way fantastic transfer by Criterion uh, you shouldn't expect anything less uh, but that's Night of the Living Dead fantastic stuff after that um, we have the film Gothic from the year 1986 and this is a Vestron release Man, you know what, guys? Like, I, I honestly don't like this film that much. It, it basically involves a group of, um, I don't know, friends who go to a, like, mansion type thing in 1816. Uh, and it involves um, Mary Shelley, who, of course, we know from writing uh, dra uh, sorry, Frankenstein. And then there was another person... Uh, there, I forget his name, Paula Dory, who uh, wrote The Vampire, which of course we know is uh, a classic literary um, vampire story. Um, and I actually don't know anything about it, I'm just trying to make stuff up. But <laughs> I've never read Frankenstein or anything. But um, yeah, I don't know, like this one is very slow. And I usually love period pieces, like period pieces are my thing, I always enjoy them. But this one is very dry. It just doesn't have much oomph to it. Like, there's long scenes of dialogue, but the dialogue is not written very well. It's very boring. It's just bland and boring dialogue. I did not have fun with this one at all. There's a few cool, shocking scenes in it. It's almost like a prequel of sorts to Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Kind of, uh, this is where she came up with the idea because the concept of this is uh, the people are there and they're trying to scare each other with stories, and I guess that's where she came up with Frankenstein. Um, they also allude to the fact that they use, like, you know, drugs or something like that, you know, and, and came up with this stuff while under the influence of alcohol and drugs, but I don't know the real story of, of how Mary Shelley came up with it. I guess it's a little speculatory. But yeah, this movie, I, I just it was okay. I didn't, I didn't love it, honestly. It was, it was a little weak for me. Uh, and then finally for this part, guys, um, for this video, we have another Vestron, and that is Class of 1999. And Class of 1999 is a really fun movie. So it involves a school in sort of like a dystopian future where the youth and the crime rates have skyrocketed. Uh, it's kind of a pseudo sequel to Class of 1984 if you guys have seen that film. Uh, basically it's a similar thing, you know, the, the youth is pretty much taken over and, and there's like these uh, free fire zones where the police won't even venture into and they're pretty much the schools uh, and these youth are on drugs and gang banging and stuff like that and then the the government creates these teachers who are cyborgs who are supposed to be able to handle this problem only they start killing the students the students fight back pretty cheesy ridiculous I mean like it's out there it, like none of this stuff makes sense in this movie um, but it's a lot of fun uh, some some cool characters. Pam Greer's in this one. I think uh, Stacy Stacy Keach might be in this one as well. Um, and I think you also have um, Malcolm McDowell in this one. So you have like quite a few people in here. Yeah, Malcolm McDowell, Stacy Keach, and the lovely, beautiful, amazing Pam Greer. Uh, and yeah, this this one's fun. It came out in the year um, 1990, uh, year before I was born. And it's it's mainly silly, got a lot of action in it. Actually, it looks like there's a ton of money put into this film. Like, there's a lot of like set pieces and explosions and like crashing school buses and stuff that you wouldn't expect it to be a low budget film. But the story is very like low budgety, like Roger Corman esque. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. I, I definitely recommend checking this one out if you haven't. This this is one of the cooler Vestron releases in a in a little while. You know, there's 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 some solid Vestrons, but um, th this one's a lot of fun.
So uh, yeah, that's it guys. Let me know if you prefer these videos where I take more time to talk about the titles or if you prefer uh, the rapid fire, let's get in there and get out uh, 10 and 10 series. Or do you want to see me go back to single reviews? You'd get a lot more of those, but um, again, they would be, you know, longer on a single film. So uh, it's like, you know, small, medium, large is essentially what we're doing here. So anyway, guys, see you guys next time with another video. Thank you for watching. As always, I greatly appreciate it. Hit me with a subscribe if you're new here. Leave me a comment. Always, I love the comments. Even though I don't always get back to replying to them immediately, I read all of them. So definitely keep leaving me comments. I very much appreciate them and enjoy them. So see you guys next time with another video. And oh yeah, Top 5 Friday. Hopefully tomorrow uh, I'll do one and then Friday I'll do another one. I totally like ran out of time doing it last Friday. So uh, we're going to catch up with those. So two new Top 5 Fridays this week, hopefully. See you guys next time. Peace.